Welcome! This is Talking Art and I'm Jane Trejere. We are continuing our conversation with local artists and today we have Tess Rock. We will be looking at her work, talking about her medium and her journey and I invite you to contact me at the email below if you have questions that you want me to ask artists that I'm not asking and if you have artists that you would like to recommend for me to interview. Thank you. Tess Rock, welcome to Talking Art. Thank you for having me. So, I like to start by asking people, where do you come from and what brought you to this region? Um, well, originally I was born in Colorado. My f mother's family brought us to the Worcester area and going to the University of Massachusetts brought me to Western Mass. And, and you just stayed. And I just stayed. <laughs> it's a nice area, you know, well, and I'm a big hiker, a big gardener, so it's nice to be in this kind of an area. All right, so um, did you start off as, uh, tell us about your, 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 your training. Did you go to college for art or um, something else completely? I originally started to, at school to be a veterinarian of all things, uh -huh. and went into the animal sciences, and then realized I spent most of my time getting my classwork done to get to studios. And I spent most of my time actually in college working in ceramics and clay. You spend most of your time getting your work done so that you could get to the studios. Is yes. that what I heard? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I see. And, and in the studios you were working in ceramics. I worked primarily in ceramics. I did have, a, I loved figure drawing classes too. Uh -huh. um, and I just kind of worked with it when it finally realized that if I'm spending all my trying, time trying to get to one thing, I probably should be doing that one thing. <laughs> well, that's great wisdom I mean, for, for a young person. Yeah, or time management. <laughs> time management. So, so y why are we not looking at ceramics today? Um, because when I had my children, um, I just did not have the time to give the ceramic medium. Clay requires a lot of time. What I consider babysitting, you have to watch it dry, you have to trim it, you have to fire it. It's a multi-staged process. I see. And painting definitely was much more immediate. I could put it down and come back to it and not worry about something has cracked or someone had bumped it and I was going to have to start from scratch again. Oh. So did you train or did you just experiment? Um, with painting it was pretty much experimenting. I did take a foundations class in painting when I was at UMass. And What um, is a foundations class? When you go to art school in order to take more advanced classes in different things or to get your degree. Um, you have to take basic drawing, basic painting, printmaking, uh, and all of those things. And ceramics actually was for me a foundations course to start because it was a sculptural medium. And then I just fell in love with it, so that's what I pursued. And I only took the courses required of me with painting. <laughs> and never actually went on any of the upper level classes. So you, you took this foundations class, they gave you a taste of a whole bunch of different yep. uh, possibilities, and you chose acrylics. Yes, ultimately. And why did you choose acrylics? Um, acrylics, well I do, I actually like watercolor, I do love drawing, um, but the acrylics, they have like a body to them that uh, makes me feel as though I can push and move it. It feels very sculptural to me. Um, and it relates actually back to the ceramics in that way for me. And oils, because of um, the fumes and everything, and working in small spaces, um, I didn't have the proper ventilation, so I just avoided them. Good logical explanations. <clears throat> so are you telling me that when you started, this is what came out? On the canvas itself, or originally when I started painting? Originally you started painting. When I first started painting, I tended to paint more um, realistic images, working a lot with floral images, with flowers and plants and that kind of thing. Did you save any of those? Yes, I did. I still have a few of them. And then I ended up going to a very um, much more brushy, quicker sort of gestural canvas. And then ultimately that brought me into this kind of painting where after I would gesture on all these colors I would bring in finer lines and start defining things. 
So what are we looking at here? This is one of your earlier ones that you've brought us. Can yes. You, what, it, how, um, how long, what year? This was around 2006 or 2007. Mm -hmm. So probably, it's probably like mid my painting career, um, so to speak, where I tend to hike outside a lot and I do carry a camera with me and walking through frozen water, you know, and by it, the um, textures and the images and the sounds and everything about it were very attractive. This is frozen water? This is frozen water. If I were to actually show you the photograph, you would see it. I see. What I see here is a lot of orange, some blue and green, and a lot of shapes that don't necessarily, perhaps a little water here. So tell right. me more about well, this. Um, you said frozen water. Frozen water. People always interpret water as a fluid state. Um, but when you're in the woods in the wintertime, it's not. It becomes very solid and very layered, especially when you're along a river, in which the flow may happen and it may even be a slushy flow. And then the upper parts actually are layers of water and, the, you know, you can, and then that breaks in as the temperatures fluctuate and creates these actually very beautiful sculptural images. But not necessarily orange. Never orange. <laughs> Oh, okay. Or if it was, I probably would not hike near that river. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> and the so the orange is your input here. Yes. Well, I actually love colors. Um, and for a while, I had worked fairly monochromatically, um, but I also was not necessarily looking to make the image of what everybody interprets water as. Um, I really just started to go with it, and when I felt like adding something, I did. I, I, I'm never shy about saying, well, this feels right on it. I'm not connected with a certain image at the end. So it's, it really becomes, it flows. Now, we, the, we, there are two here that are, what are their names? What are they called? Um, the first one is metamorphic, which for me means changing. Uh -huh. um, well, that's, the, what's, what's, yeah. that's what the word means. And that one feels like that to me. It's an ever-changing process. And, the, and this one that's the, the vertical one? Um, it's Genesis. I, did, I, I really actually have trouble naming my canvases because I'm I never really see. sure. <laughs> but for the second one here, um, Genesis, I just felt like there were, it felt to me like there was a lot of atmospheric things going on in the beginnings of something, especially yes. as the blue begins to wrap and the yellows come out of the top, There's just a lot of energy. And when it came to me, it pretty much stuck. That's magnificent. Um, but it was also very heavily influenced by water. So I also I see in this one some play of light. <coughs> well, you have it here too, but here it's like, I'm, I'm, just as you use your imagination, I'm looking at it and I'm using my imagination yeah. as well. And I'm seeing, I don't know, landscapes. You saw Which the creation, yeah. the, the, this, this mountain feature down here on the bottom left with the light behind it. It's, uh, it's always interesting. So, so as you see that image as the yellow is a negative image, yes. in, the negative, in the background, I see that as a foreground image. Oh. So that it's one of those things that So that's like a cavern. Yes, it could be. And, but that's also why I do hesitate sometimes to even name my pieces because everybody comes to it with their own thoughts. Well, isn't, thoughts. That, isn't that wonderful? I hope so. <laughs> that's, that's, that's really wonderful. So I do like, um, uh, that's also why I like doing shows, because I love hearing what people have to say. I don't necessarily want to tell them what I see, um, because I, I want to hear what they say, so that I, want, I can understand if they actually are getting what I want to say, or if they're getting more out of it than I want to say with the pieces, which is all, my ultimate goal, really. Well, what is it that you want to say? Um, I want people to think. I want people to explore. I don't want people to be timid. And, um, and I don't want people to feel as though they shouldn't be able to say things. I often feel like sometimes you get pigeonholed and you're supposed to do things in a very standard way. And, um, and I don't want that for people. I, actually, I, it really is about the people viewing them as much as it is about my being able to make them. Well, this is your water series. A part of it, a small section uh -huh. of it, yes. And uh, over here, right here in, in the... So then I began to feel as though I was playing too much with just purely organic forms. Um, and this one does not have a title. 
and um, I really began to push harder to put linear, like when I say linear, straighter lines, parallel lines, um, adding more geometric, hard edge type features to my work. Well, well, well there's plenty of hard edge here. Yeah, but none of them are straight. <laughs> so why do you need straight? Um, probably because I feel as though when I'm painting and I'm exploring, I want new tools for the way in which I want to speak on my canvas. So if I just continuously play with the things I'm completely comfortable with, I don't think I would ever grow my language. So throwing in um, you know, straighter lines and pushing myself to do something that does it. Also, it pushes the way in which I paint. Uh, you know, besides just putting in lines, it pushes my compositions. And it can make things less comfortable. How do I cope with the fact that I have a triangle in the middle of a canvas? You know, um, it's and just all those things and how do I get it to translate? Is into there a there. triangle? Well, for me, that little arrow point there, I don't even know what it is really. Um, the the comes, orange one? Yeah. You know, for me, that was a very difficult aspect of the canvas to, you know, work with. So this kind of piece really is me figuring out new things, and you know, and, and so still I free see, flowing. I see an architectural element to it, which I think. The linear thing does. Well, it's like like Greek columns over here, a leaning column. Yeah. And, I, and I've had friends who, when I started doing this, took some of my pieces to become a little bit more musical. Well, I actually saw a musical instrument, um, like, a, like some kind of uh, string instrument right yeah. here in the, in the bottom with a... And that's, with yeah, the, the repetition of the lines yeah. and that kind oh, of thing. Oh, interesting. So, it, I mean, th that's this right. is an exploration. It's very interesting that two random other people should say instruments. Yeah. I mean, there is no instrument here. No, there isn't. And, you know, there's a vague inkling of a potential figure, maybe. Yes. Um, but I, but well, once again, I don't here, know. Over here, I think, I think I'm safe to say that those are trees. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and They're so, blue trees, though. Yes. Well, actually, this canvas has been reinvented a few times. What do you mean by um, that? There was a, the, when I had originally done the painting, um, they, and I was working directly with tree imagery, and the painting was just completely vertical up and down, because I was really trying hard to explore the essence of what vertical lines were and horizontal, horizontal lines without a lot of those curves. And for years, it actually sat in my um, studio until this past fall. And because I never, I, I never, said it was complete to me. So then finally, after I had been exploring a lot more um, with color and forms, I threw in, it went from a less, it was much more white and on the purpler end of blues. And I said that was it. And I started throwing in um, the orange colors, the chromiums, the yellows, and the reds, and started to play with the backlighting of having like reflecting off of things um, and wondering which direction it's coming from and just manipulated it until I thought, oh, this is what I was looking to do and added more curved forms. I think also I like the curved forms because I feel like they do a nice carryover. They keep the viewer rotating through their pieces, the pieces. Oh, I see what you mean, yes. And also they're not necessarily logical. So for instance, this, this, this sort of the, the second tree back yep. on the left, the branch that goes up is joining another shape that yes. it's it's not a tree anymore it's something else it's like well it's ca it's cavernous it's cavernous right although if you explore like I've been with a lot of trees and um, when you actually see trees that are old and beaten up and they've lost part of their branches and you actually get to access the interiors of the trees uh -huh. um, it sort of has that feeling to it so it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a tall and complete finished tree, more like the one that's on the left side of the painting. Well, there's a whole world that's going on beyond that hole yeah, in that Which case. I actually, I have, a, I do love trees, and they are a whole world going beyond just what we see. Right. And this one that's on the forefront on the right is like we're seeing all of the inside of the tree yep, and without it being literal in any way whatsoever. Yes. Uh, that's pretty much the size of it, yeah. <laughs> yes. And it's when was when did you paint that one? Um, I finished it for because it, it just ha I was in a show out in East Hampton, um, so I had to finish it in November. Oh, so this is quite recent. Yeah. 
So the, the thing about acrylics is you can walk away and come back years later and keep adding to it. Yeah, I, I, it's really nice. So it gives me the opportunity to pull something out and say, you know, I'm much better at this now. I can improve the image. Oh. Sometimes I will go back and do that to paintings. Not that most people would know what I did, except they might clean up a line, um, brush on and blush on a little bit more color now that I've become much more familiar with glazing techniques. So you paint on the side of the canvas I as do. well. Yes, I do. <clears throat> Which means if I were to purchase one of your pieces, how would I frame it? Um, would I just uh, hide well, all that? Well, no, not necessarily. They have frames in which you can actually leave a space around uh -huh. and it kind of floats inside the frame. And the mu there's multiple reasons why I have chosen to paint on the edges of the canvas. Yes. One is very practical. When I go to do shows, I'm not confronted with the issue of frames. Oh. So it's very practical. The other thing that happens is in the process of my work, sometimes I get undirected with where I'm going with the painting. And, I don't, and when I go to painting the edge of the painting, Sometimes it allows me just enough thought in that process that it, it flows me back on and it reintroduces me to the piece. What an interesting device. Which, it, and it was not never done intentionally. It just sort of happens. Um, Sounds to me like sort of a life lesson. <laughs> <laughs> but, and the other thing, too, is I actually truly believe that um, when people purchase pieces, frames are about introducing the piece to the place it's hanging as well as vice versa so that it fits better in the environment it's going into. Oh. So I really think that like when people frame pieces it, it should be about um, introducing. The room that it's in as well yes. as the picture. Yes, I think so. I think it's a nice way to connect them together. Right. Uh-huh. So the last two pieces we yes. have are the one behind us and the one over here yeah. that's mostly green. Yeah. Which would you like to speak about first? Um, we can keep going in the order. So this one was finished, I guess, in sometime in November too. Um, and it is, I do tend to work sometimes in series, where a few years ago I had a triptych that was um, in a show out at the APE Gallery in Northampton. And it was done when I was exploring the verticals and yes. figuring out a blend. This one is a result of that one particular um, triptych that I had done because that was all about doing verticals but then figuring out how to blur them in and out which relates to the trees and the fact that often if you hike in the woods a lot and you're moving and you're doing things things look different on your peripheral than uh -huh. they do when you're looking straight forward uh -huh. and the information and then you know if you let your imagination run you also start seeing things and they you know the flow of images so, so it's a little bit like having a double exposure of both your frontal view and your could be yeah and your peripheral <laughs> vision. I like that. Yeah, I like that. Um, and then I ended up doing that one, ended up selling, and then I did another triptych, still exploring the same thing but with more vivid colors. The one that was at APE was much more neutral in colors for the way in which I work. Um, it was yellows and greens, but toned down because of the show I was in. Well, this one is quite different from yes. everything else that's here. This is much, this is flat. Yes. There is no depth here. And not, uh, I'm, perhaps I'm sitting too close to see it, but I, I think that I'm not seeing the work that you've well, done here. Well, there isn't here, which, the push which, the depth. Right, there's no, yep. this has a lot of depth to it. Even this last one here has some, but it's like, it's like, hmm, it's not like deep. It's like it stops right there. It's like two inches behind at most. And well, Whereas here it's like yards and yards away. <laughs> and so is this one. And so is that one. And so is this one. But this one is hmm, it's more like a, a carving on wood. Well, it could be. So what ultimately happened is I did this in, in that way in which I just wanted a flow of forms flowing in and out gently. It wasn't about needing to... You know, if I had done many more of these dark I things, you know, the dark markings and that kind of thing, it may, it would push it harder, um, and then it would require a little bit more of highlighting of things. Um, and at that point, I just felt as though it was complete enough without doing that. And then this last one I came into, 
I literally did it in December just as something that I wanted to sort of explore and start transitioning into my next phase of work. And it was really just about instead of having, which I have had for a few years now, like a thought pattern, I'm going to work with this type of imagery and that type of imagery, I just um, had been doing some sketches and gently sketched it right onto the canvas and then just let it free flow with wherever I wanted to make things dark and light um, and decide what areas to push back and pull forward. This, this is very expressionistic to me, this one. Uh, well, I feel like I, it could be in the 1930s expressionistic show, expre yeah, expressionism show. There's something very, it almost also feels a little bit like, like the paper cut. You know, this, this, it's quite different from the rest here. Yes, well, it's, uh, it's almost bringing that hard line mixed in with the more flowy imagery from the water images. So that it has, so it allows me that kind of thing. I also feel like there's something about the way in which the blues are treated that have almost a metallic nature to them. Yes. Um, yes. And, and and so, yeah. it was this one. It was a result of a lot more glazing. What uh, does that mean, glazing? Um, well, when you put down like this, has you put down a painting. And then as I build up the forms, I will, instead of putting down another layer of painting directly on it to obliterate what's below it, to remove it, instead I will gently put on a thinner film and then build it up so you can actually end up seeing that there's green. A thinner film of? Of the paint. So where underneath the yellows you can see the greens and the blues and vice versa, or I may just even put a slight bit of red in to like blend into the blue so I'm gently bringing the colors through. So when people say glazing it's not like they're covering the paint with some clear substance. Right. They're covering when you're talking in painting terms you're talking about a thinner version of the paint. Yes typically I mean people can people will put a finish on a painting called a glaze but when you're actually working in the medium you're actually, when you're glazing, you're really putting another film of color over another film of color, and you don't want to get rid of the color that's below it. You want it to shine through. You want it to reflect through the painting that you're putting on top of it. Uh-huh. I have heard of people putting that finished glaze yeah. between layers as well. Yes, although I, I, yeah, I've never felt the need for it. Right. No, it, it gives a completely different effect. Um, and for me, and the acrylic paints themselves, when you're working with them, um, I don't start with a fresh tray of paint every time. I put them in a container and they're sealed. And then eventually what happens, in, because you're always spraying them down with water, because they'll dry out on like an oil when it's exposed to the air. So I put them in that kind of a thing. But eventually what happens is the paints themselves start to separate out this gel gelatinous type medium so that it also that like it creates its own medium within the paint tray itself that I will also use to if I just want like a slight slight blush of another color on something I'll actually use that instead of the full force of the color or watering that color down oh so it's sort of a it's been years of developing it, it, it. it's separating itself yes so which is the part that you're using the clearer Part. So it's almost like a clear gel, but it would be a clear blue gel or, oh. you know, or one with the cadmiums or one with the cobalt so that it just has this different texture uh -huh. and feel. And it works differently on the paint canvas because if you were just adding water to acrylic, thins it and thins it. But then at one point it becomes almost a watercolor, so it loses its viscousness. Uh -huh. um, and when, you have, when that stuff starts to happen on my palette and I use it, it keeps body to the paint so I can really push it. And because when you're painting with acrylics, I can actually take, you know, in order to create some of this edging, I can actually push the paint exactly where I want it, clean it up, and then blend it through so that I can get edges with it. Now, <clears throat> these are quite large. Some of these are larger. Mm -hmm. uh, f at the, the last show we had at the Deerfield Arts Bank, you had some miniature versions of these. I did. Now, d do you... Do you normally do miniatures? I don't usually do small pieces. Um, I have found that uh, I feel more 
in control on a larger canvas than I do in a smaller canvas. So why do you choose to do all the little ones? Um, part of it is just for experimentation. Sometimes it's nice to take a small canvas. Um, I mean, I'm, when I'm saying small, I mean small. Like yeah, like six by six inches. And yeah. I've worked even smaller. And sometimes it's just nice when I don't have a lot of time to do something. And I, or I am just so distracted in my thought that if I just pull up something simple, I can just work on it. And, I, th and I'm not committed to it. I don't feel as though, like if I were to be in the middle of a canvas and then not be ready to paint, but knowing in order to be a very good painter, you have to do it, whether you're ready or not for it. And so that's pretty much why I do the small ones, is like uh -huh. little vignettes. Vignettes of, <laughs> of, of all of this. Yes. I see. Hmm. So, so are you going to be continuing in this vein? Actually, I don't, I don't know where I'm quite going yet. You um, don't? No, well, this is, a, I have been doing shows for like a couple of years. Where do you do your shows? Um, I've done them out in Worcester, out in East Hampton, um, in different places. So to give us some names, um, East Hampton. The, I think it's the Lucy, Lucy Gallery. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm never really quite sure. Sorry, Jean-Pierre. Um, yes. <laughs> and I've shown at, um, like at the University of Massachusetts, you know, the Jones Library. But I have to say, I do have a liking to showing in public places. When I say a public place, like a cafe. Um, and right now, I actually have work that's showing in a salon in Amherst. I feel as though art has been too separated from people, uh -huh. like the population in general. Um, so it's nice when I put my work in a cafe where people wouldn't expect this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then they sit with it for a few months. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, I had my coffee with this painting. And when you first hung it, they didn't want to say anything. And then after they've actually lived with it, they have a better appreciation for it. And it just sort of opens their world a little bit differently because not everybody goes into galleries. Um, and I feel like galleries you know, can be very difficult at times for people to enter. They feel like, well, I'm not educated. I don't know anything. And the reality is you don't have to be educated in what you like or what you respond to. Well, this is a little bit what I'm trying to do here. I'm, I'm, I'm asking the questions that other people will say, well, what are they talking about? Yep. So what do you mean by <laughs> glaze? And you know, I'm not always sure exactly either. So I'm asking questions. That's what I mean by, you know, send me the questions you want me to ask the artist. Right. So, um, so right now you're in this, uh, in this, in this uh, Cheryl Nina Salon Day, Day Spa in Amherst. Yes, I am. And also, the m what is model behavior in? So in Worcester, um, I've joined an arts group out there. It's closer to where my parents are, and I needed. I was ready to reconnect as my children have gotten older. I can reconnect with time, um, and they do a group show of all their members. And it was all figurative pieces, and um, I have a piece in that show at the moment, which is... Figurative? Fi yes, actually, my whole last year's work, which was what was out in um, the East Hampton Gallery, was all figurative for the most part. That also then brought you into the blends of these, so I didn't even bring any of the figurative pieces, because it can get complicated for complicated. people to see how my mind bounces. But I, that, that's what I mean when I try to explore something, uh -huh. gain information and then go with it. So this year I have no ultimate direction except well, to paint. So when you are in a, in, a, in a group show, do your fellow artists influence you or um, spark some, some not ne no, direction not for you? Not necessarily. It's a new group for me to start with. Um, if I were in a critique groups, they tend to influence my work more um, because you're talking with people more directly. But when you're part of a group show, you just tend to meet artists at that moment in time. And then if there's time, you do end up with conversations with them. Um, and then a discussion about mediums. But whether they influence or not, at times they can. But I think it has more to do with being in someone's studio with them or seeing their work more frequently as they're working. Well, I hope you'll come back um, and show us what you're working on next after this. Absolutely. I have a feeling that I wanted to play, go re return to my water series a little bit because one of my favorite pieces, which is not here because I don't own it anymore, um, was sold. That's good. That's yes. good. Well, it is good, but it also means parting with something that, like, 
I haven't had as much time to visit with, so I may return to that series just to explore that a little bit more. Well, I look forward to that. Well, thank you. Tess, thank you very much. And um, you've been listening to Tess Rock and me, Jane Treger, and this is Talking Art. Uh, we are sitting at the Deerfield Arts Bank, and uh, we'll meet you again next time with another artist. Uh, I welcome comments and questions you'd like me to ask that I'm not asking the artists. Please send it to the email below, and uh, thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>